Yes, Tune drops tomorrow. It's been a while since I've been annoying about a movie. This will be fun. Oh, snap. I gotta make a video about that. Please at least engage with the idea that the narrative of Dune is that explicitly white savers are bad and make shit worse because they make shit about themselves. Oh, I'd find a way to make it as not about Twunk as possible. All right. Just please don't recycle the lazy criticism it gets on Twitter. Honestly, I have other things to make videos about. Plus, I'm not actually going to watch Twunk until it's out on digital and I can pirate it. I'm going to watch both of them through in one sitting, and then I'm probably never going to think about either of those movies ever again. Okay, fine. I watched Dunk Part 2. Guess what? Turns out it was great. Great enough to justify spending almost three hours of my life on watching it? Mmm, debatable. I mean, I was never not going to watch it. Shit, I watched the first one. That's the point of splitting this shit into two parts, right? Well, for as big a shit I talk about how our entertainment is an opiate and inevitable distraction from the real things in the world that actually matter, I'm not immune to hype and propaganda. And if I'm being real, my main beef with the first dunk wasn't so much anything in the film itself, but rather the way it was used to lure audiences back to movie theaters during a goddamn pandemic, which I will never forgive the studios for. It's like what they did with Tenet, except dunk is actually a good movie. I can't keep calling it Dunk, that's too obnoxious even for me. Although, when I say Dune, unless I specify otherwise, I'm talking about both part one and part two put together, because they're a full story, and I hate splitting full stories into two parts. That's stupid Hollywood marketing bullshit. This is only the beginning. I'm not here to tell you that Dune is bad, because that's just it. It's not. I know I voice objections to the notion of objectivity in art while simultaneously referring to many pieces of art as objectively good, but with blockbuster cinema, there is such a thing as an objective measure of a film's quality in terms of craft and construction. And the plain fact is, Dune is very competently made. It checks off all the boxes, the direction is great, the performances are great, the sound and visual design are great, it's just all around pretty good. And like, super serious space opera epics aren't really my thing. I don't find them particularly entertaining or enriching or engaging, so when I say that Dune is really good, you know I'm not some easy-to-please sci-fi fangirl. My standards for the sci-fi and fantasy genres are very high. Dune more than meets those standards. The closest thing I can compare it to as far as literary adaptation goes is the first half of Game of Thrones. And in fact, this may be blasphemous, but these two films are better than the entire Star Wars original trilogy. It's not even close. Now, my conscience is clean. I did not pay for the experience of watching this film in any way. I contributed nothing directly to the studio's coffers. So why am I choosing to waste my time talking about Dune enough to make a whole ass video of it? Because I'm gonna use it to talk about real shit. Obviously. Do y'all not know me by now? Because Dune has problems, and they're problems that are worth talking about. So if you just came here to know if Dune's good and worth watching or not, I've already answered that. Have a great day. I'll see you next time. For the rest of you, though, those who care about the real things, let's get into it. Firstly, I grew up with the notion of Dune being unadaptable or unfilmable, and that's just utter bullshit. I mean, it was bullshit even before Denis Villeneuve came along. We only believe this unadaptable myth because Hollywood has never managed to actually pull it off well before now. The reason that the 1984 Dune was such a train wreck was because it was made as an attempt to capitalize on Star Wars during a time when Hollywood filmmaking was overall pretty shit, and turns out it's pretty damn difficult to make a single two and a half hour film out of a book that's like a thousand pages long, especially when its director is wholly incompatible with mainstream Hollywood filmmaking. If you want to cut the time down, what, what is this with everybody? No, 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 no. What is it? It's really? Why? Well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm serious. Fucking A, man. It drives me nuts. Who gives a fucking shit how long a scene is? And then, of course, there's the unrealized vision of Chilean madman and rapist Alejandro Jodorowsky, which was basically so ambitious that it was completely unfeasible to create within the context of the mainstream film industry. When you make a picture, you must not respect the novel. It's like you get a married. No? You take the woman. If you respect the woman, you will never have childs. You need to, to rape the bride. And then you will, you will have your picture. I was raping Frank Heber, you know? Raping like this, but with love. With love. Featuring Salvador Dali and Orson Welles, designed by H.R. Geiger and John Giraud, music by Pink Floyd, and most prohibitively, a 10 to 14 hour runtime. No shit, that version was never gonna get made. But, as it turns out, if you put Dune the novel into the hands of one of the few consistently competent mainstream directors, stack the cast with the biggest stars of the day, let it be long enough to tell the full story, and, most importantly, pour a fucking shitload of money into it, turns out you can make a pretty good adaptation. Who'd have thunk? 
And if we're being real, Dune is actually a very straightforward story. Sure, it's big and has a lot of characters and complex politics and shit, but narratively, it's very simple. It's very linear. It's just Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> Frankly, I don't believe in unadaptability. I used to consider House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski to be the most unadaptable book of all time. But turns out that in 2018, a damn good House of Leaves pilot screenplay was written by none other than Mark Z. Danielewski. Incredible. I feel like it's passe at this point to shut down the criticism of Dune bad because Paul White savior because it's literally what the entire story is about. Southern tribes believe the Messiah will come to deliver us from evil. You don't believe in the Lusan al -Gayu. We believe in Fremen. You want to control people? You tell them a Messiah will come. Then they'll wait for centuries. Yes, Dune is about how messianic religion is used to manipulate oppressed peoples into following leaders that do not have their best interests at heart. It's not a prophecy. It's a story that you keep telling, but it's not their story, it's yours. What your people did to this world is heartbreaking. We gave them something to hope for. That's not hope! Paul is a white colonizer who assumes the role of savior that ultimately leads him to power, and that's fucking awful. Millions and millions of people starving to death because of me. No shit. If anything, Dune Part 2 goes out of its way to tell the audience how they should feel about Paul's ascension. Like, in huge fucking neon lights. This prophecy is how they enslave us! How they dominate- They alter Chani's entire character to make her practically look into the camera and tell us directly that Paul is no messiah and it, he should not be given power. I could aim the bombs at the main spice fields. He who can destroy a thing has the real control of it. You promised me you didn't want power. I am Paul Mwadib Atreides, Duke of Arrakis, Nelisan al Gai, Rui Dimen Aruk Ashidi, Nelisan al Gai! Like, if you miss that, I don't know what to tell you except to go back to something more on your reading level. Like, Star Wars. That's an order! Now, personally, I'm an adult with common sense and a heart, and I don't need a five and a half hour film to show me that white saviors are a feature of colonialism and an unequivocally bad thing. That wasn't even new information when the novel came out in 1965. So I never really gave much of a shit about Dune as a story, even as recently as just after the release of Dune Part 1. But things have changed, and my recent emotional investment in global geopolitics has made me deeply interested in and fascinated by Dune. That is, I find value in it now, as it relates to the real world. If somehow you aren't familiar with the real world, the Fremen of Dune are analogous to the Arab peoples of the Middle East. That should be pretty obvious, despite the decision to not cast any significant Fremen characters with Arab actors, which was... a decision. It's a decision, I, I understand why they made it, just like I understand why they use the term holy war instead of jihad like it is in the book. See, Dune is fundamentally and unavoidably orientalist, and making the Fremen literal Arabs makes things significantly stickier and more problematic. Also, American audiences will literally shit themselves at the word jihad, cause, well, we be like that. <laughs> Yes, Orientalism is bad, and anyone who has objections to Dune on that basis is 100% totally valid. The Orientalism isn't necessarily my main issue. I look at it as an inherent feature of the story, and I can't imagine how one would tell the story without at least some shade of it. I suppose it would be different if Dune was made by Arab filmmakers instead, but that's just the thing. I don't think Dune is a story that Arab filmmakers would want to tell. I don't speak for anyone, of course, this is just my take as a repentant white colonizer analyzing a film about unrepentant white colonizers, but this framing is important to understand. While Dune is a story about the white colonizers' exploitation of oppressed black and brown people living in the desert and how that's bad, it is still a story being told by and from the perspective of those white colonizers. And when this story being told very clearly and directly represents real black and brown people who have been experiencing real oppression and colonialist occupation for over 60 years, since before this story was ever written in the first place, that matters. This is the main problem with science fiction, and fantasy for that matter. The extent to which you can talk about the real world using entirely fabricated worlds is inherently limited by the fantastical conventions of the genre itself. One of the clearest examples of this would be Avatar. Avatar is very clearly an allegory for humankind's capitalist exploitation and destruction of natural resources in the interest of profit, and how it comes at the expense of indigenous peoples and their homes and culture. However, this allegory is neutered by the fact that this is a magical, non-existent planet, inhabited not by human beings, but by literal aliens. We don't go to Pandora to think about our actual planet being destroyed and the actual people being destroyed with it. We go to Pandora specifically to forget about our actual planet. 
It is an escape. It is entertainment. Yeah, James Cameron is very vocal about how much he cares about our destruction of the natural world, and yeah, one can see this reflected in the Avatar movies. But that being said, Avatar does not actually work as a vehicle for empathy for real human beings. See, James Cameron does not give a fuck about actual indigenous peoples. If he did, instead of spending billions of dollars over decades and creating this pretty little fake world with fake overgrown cat people to tell a basic ass white man's story about colonialism, he would have used his name and money to finance and promote the work of actual indigenous filmmakers and their projects. And just like I said in my Avatar The Last Airbender 2024 video about the Air Nomads, I do not give a fuck about the Na'vi. Fictional characters. I don't care if in the story, every last one of them is killed and all of Pandora is raised to the ground. Because they are not real. It's fiction. And honestly, I'd much prefer to save my compassion for the actual indigenous people the Na'vi are supposed to theoretically represent. Fuck Avatar and fuck James Cameron. But going back to Dune. I'd say Dune is better about this than Avatar, given that the Fremen, despite being from a different planet, are very much coded as human. We see these people and their culture and recognize them for who they're clearly supposed to represent. But as soon as we analyze Dune a little bit further and dig into the details, we can discover the limitations of its allegory. I think of it kind of like Zootopia, Disney's frankly embarrassing attempt at making real-world commentary on racial inequality. Go back to the forest, Predator! I'm from the savannah! The Predator animals being treated like racial minorities who need to be controlled and tamed, for lack of a better word. They fail to illustrate the nature of racial prejudice because the logic of the story totally supports these prejudices. Black and brown people are not dangerous or a threat to others, which is why racism is flawed, illogical, and absurd. But lions and tigers and bears are dangerous and objectively threats to creatures like rabbits and mice and deer and shit. Zootopia's racial hierarchy does have the logic to justify it. And in Dune, because it is science fiction in the same way Zootopia is fantasy, their hierarchy and system of control is somewhat justified. In a logical sense, of course, not, not an ethical one. Because we can say all we want that Paul is not actually a messiah. I'm not messiah. He's not actually the Quicksap Hadrack or Lisa Al Gabe or whoever the fuck, but that's just it. He is, though. I'm not the Mahdi. I'm pointing the way! What are you afraid of? Worship. They used to be friends. Now they're followers. Duke of Arrakis! We need you, we need the Lisa Al Gaib to lead our people. You know what I think of all that? The Lisa Al Gaib! I'm not here to lead. Demon Aruk Ashidi! The Fremen aren't deceived into making Paul their messiah, because he is their messiah. We need you, we need the Lisa Al Gaib to lead our people. You know what I think of all that, Stone Dark? I don't care what you believe, I believe! Look how your Bene Gesserit propaganda has taken root. Some of them already think I'm their messiah. I must sway the non-believers. If they follow me, we can disrupt spice production. That's the only way I can get to the Emperor. We must convert the non-believers one by one. We need to start with the weaker ones, the vulnerable ones. Now we go south. There are millions of fundamentalists there. He really does not have any choice in the matter, despite his displays of reluctance. She's also wondering why you don't believe in who you are. It's not a prophecy. It's a story that you keep telling, but it's not their story, it's yours. They deserve to be led by one of their own. The entire story is already written from genesis to genocide, and he is quite literally thrust into assuming his horrific role in this ultimately incredibly bleak story. What your people did to this world is heartbreaking. We gave them something to hope for. That's not hope! Hope? We are Bene Gesserit. We don't hope, we plan. Meanwhile, the Bene Gesserit, meanwhile, the Bene Gesserit, how do you say that? Meanwhile, the Bene Gesserit are supposed to be analogous to missionaries who taught and instilled their belief system into colonized people. Nothing can live there without faith, which is why our Bene Gesserit missionaries have been so productive there. But that doesn't work when you think of things in terms of reality. Because Christian preachers and missionaries are all frauds, charlatans, and hucksters. They deceive and control through lies and colonialist mythology, but they're all just as human and flawed as the people they attempt to convert. The Bene Gesserit, on the other hand, they are actually magic. Remove the gag! Kill him! They can fucking mind control people with ease, see a future that's already been determined, can survive drinking straight up poison. It's no miracle. My mother was trained to do that. Poison transmutation is something advanced Bene Gesserit can do. 
all things which would be considered miraculous and deserving of the power and influence they have over the galaxy. And speaking of power and influence over the galaxy, can we talk about spice? This fictional element is basically just magic. It has no single real-world parallel because it's a panacea, something that represents the best thing a capitalist could dream of, an unlimited resource that does everything. Thus, spice becomes the currency of ultimate power in Dune. Same with the stupid-ass unobtainium from the first Avatar and the stupid-ass space whale oil in the second. It's a magical MacGuffin. It's just what makes the story happen the way it happens. Despite his assertions to the contrary, by Dune's internal logic and reality, Paul is actually a superhuman alien messiah, the chosen one, just like he was created and written to be. You don't believe in the Lusan al -Gayu. We believe in Fremen, Bilal Kaifa. Bilal Kaifa. <laughs> And ultimately, at the end of the day, despite how much is said about the Fremen people, this story fundamentally belongs to Paul. It's not a prophecy. It's a story that you keep telling, but it's not their story, it's yours. They deserve to be led by one of their own. It is from his perspective that we experience this story. My allegiance is to you, to the Fremen. I'm doing this for all of us. And while Chani does work pretty well as a voice of reason with the right priorities, this story belongs to Paul. Chani. I won't be fighting for him. I'm fighting for my people. It is a tale of his revenge and rise to power, of him doing what he believes is right. And while the text does insist we question and even dispute his ascension through the character of Chani, he remains the ultimate focus. Yeah, my take is that despite its borderline excessive lip service to caring about the plight and oppression of the Fremen, Dune as a text doesn't actually give a shit about the Fremen. How can I possibly claim this? The text itself insists multiple times, over and over, that at the end of the day, this is about freeing the Fremen from oppression. But, my dear strangers, if that were actually the case, then I need you to answer me a very simple, glaring question. Where are all the Fremen children? There's this constant talking about the Fremen people, the reason for the revolt. But, like... Where is all that? Never once do we see any of the Fremen except their warriors and freedom fighters. But what about their children and their families? What about the homes where people cook, clean, do everyday stuff, the stuff of real life? Where is the community of people that these freedom fighters are fighting for? Okay, correction from editing Vivian. There is exactly one Fremen child seen in Villeneuve's Dune. This brief haunting shot amidst the aftermath of the Harkonnens' Israel-style artillery attack. Old-fashioned artillery. Genius. But this scene passes so quickly that it barely registered to me, even after two viewings. After a few wails and indistinct shots of minor injuries, Paul and the Fremen fighters are alerted to the war council called in the south, and the plot keeps progressing forth. <laughs> I don't know, it just feels weird to me. And the brevity of this small scene and the way it's basically immediately forgotten kind of emphasizes my point. No one but the camera notices this child, especially not Paul. And like, this is a particularly odd blind spot considering that apparently in the book, Paul and Chani literally had a child during all this, one who got killed by the Harkonnens. I don't know, food for thought. When Paul says he wants to be one of the Fremen, what does that actually entail beyond fighting their battles with them? What would you do? Would strike even further north. Then I will go further north. Further north you go, the more likely it is you die. What is Paul's relationship with the rest of the Fremen, outside the few he fights alongside, outside of his buddy and his girlfriend? Duncan said there were millions of them in the deep south. We're told that there are millions living in the South. There are millions of fundamentalists there. So why don't we see any evidence of them? <laughs> and if the Fremen are analogous to Arabs in the Middle East, what does it say about Dune that the only Fremen it focuses on are the militant religious fundamentalists doing guerrilla warfare in the desert? It might surprise you to learn, but a majority of people in the Middle East are not militants in caves, the terrorists we've been trained and conditioned by propaganda to think of all Arab people as. Well, it shouldn't actually surprise you because if you've been paying any attention to the world, especially the Middle East, you've been seeing what the people there are actually like as they're massacred. Just people, flesh and blood, like any of the rest of us, and most of them are children. My big problem with Dune is what it is asking us to care about and prioritize. Human beings are reduced to abstractions, represented by emaciated plastic dolls in Paul's visions, and words and phrases like, the people. But the people being killed and displaced and starved in Gaza 
aren't abstractions. Each and every one of them is very real, just as complex and nuanced a being as chosen one protagonist Paul Atreides is. Thinking of it like this makes the weight of the concept genocide feel a bit different, huh? A bit heavier? A bit more serious? Because it's not just Gaza. There are genocides unfolding all over the colonized world, and have been for a while. Palestine, Sudan, the Congo, Hawaii, Tigray, to name but a few. And even within the empire itself. Think of the mass death from COVID that the US government is responsible for. Millions upon millions, even billions of people over the last few centuries. And every single last one of those numbers is as historically important as Paul fucking Atreides. As spectacular and incredible as it genuinely is, I do not care about this genocidal colonizer's story. Dune is a bleak tragedy, a complex villain's origin story. But honestly, real life is bleak enough. I don't need another tragedy to make me feel sorry for individuals who do horrific things with power. As far as I'm concerned, when Paul wins at the end of Dune Part 2, fascism wins, and the universe loses. I'll take the hand of your daughter, and we will rule together over the Empire. So unless the third movie is going to be Chani assassinating Paul's imperialist ass, I don't need any more Dune. The story has finally been done well, and I think it's time to let this one go. Oh, a few random notes I forgot to bring up. One. God damn, these sandworms are fucking awesome. <laughs> no notes. Two. She won't talk. I already know everything I need to know. Fade Ratha had no business being as hot and kinky as he was. Only pleasure remains. Fuck me. They're flood water traders. From his sadomasochism in Skarsgård's Smolder to his entourage of shameless cannibals. <laughs> I love this character. <laughs> and low-key, I kind of really enjoyed he and his uncle's whole gay, incestuous, kinky power dynamic thing. Show me who you are. Like, yeah, it's pretty gross and they're repulsive characters, but it's still, it's a very interesting character dynamic. Rid me of this Fremen demon. Couple of people who totally got off, bro. What? You did? Mm. Are you serious? Big time. Three. I saw our bloodline, mother. Written across time. So I hadn't read the book, so I had no idea about this plot twist. He learns that his mother is Baron Harkonnen's daughter. You are the daughter of Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Which makes him as much of a vile Harkonnen as an honorable Atreides, and his embracing of this is what compels his transformation upon resurrecting. So this is how we'll survive. By being Harkonnens. To again emphasize Dune's superiority over Star Wars, this plot twist predates the Darth Vader twist in Empire Strikes Back. It's also the same kind of twist that The Rise of Skywalker tried to do with the reveal that Rey is actually a Palpatine, which continues to be the single stupidest retcon writing decision in that entire franchise. Maybe it actually works in Dune because this is actually the story of a villain, the kind of monster that Disney would never have the balls to commit to in a Star Wars. Grandfather. And speaking of Paul's escalation into a villain, for why the fuck did no one tell me about the nuclear weapons? Every house possesses an atomic arsenal. The 92 original Atreides family's atomic warheads. That is power. I realize that, again, this is part of the point of Dune, but it always bugs me how casual a lot of big films like this are about things like nuclear fucking warfare. A class of warfare that is so apocalyptic and destructive and horrific that we have not engaged in it since the first time we tried almost 80 years ago. If you don't want to raise an army in the South, you still have an option. Firepower. I know where your father hid the family atomics. It's wild that this is what Paul accepts as an alternative to amassing an army of Fremen freedom fighters. Fremen freedom fighters. Try saying that three times fast. Fremen freedom fighters. This kind of ultimate scorched earth warfare is the work of colonizers. I could aim the bombs at the main spice fields. He who can destroy a thing has the real control of it. Indigenous people anywhere would never consider a military strategy that so thoroughly ravages and destroys the land they belong to. How many heads exactly? Enough to blow up the whole planet. It's a figure of speech. You know what I mean. Think of what the Israeli army does to the olive groves in Palestine. And sure enough, once Paul drinks the water and fully embraces his cursed lineage as a murderous tyrant, So this is how we'll survive, by being Harkonnens. 
guided solely by the calculus of power, he escalates to nuclear warfare after raising the army of millions that he said he wouldn't. Then he murders his political rivals, seizes a princess claiming her as a bride slash war trophy slash tool, and declares himself the fucking emperor of the universe. You will bow at my feet. Your feet! You'll be lucky to keep your head. I'll take the hand of your daughter. And we will rule together over the empire. Oh, while holding the planet, the one he is ostensibly fighting for, hostage with fucking nukes. If the great houses attack, our atomics will obliterate all spice fields. You're out of your mind. He's bluffing. Consider what you're about to do, Paul Atreides. Silence! Sploosh. Chani really should have killed him when she had the chance. And lastly, five, nothing to do with the movie. I just want to voice my appreciation for how inappropriately gay and horny Rebecca Ferguson is. Also, you have great legs. And also, they're cutting to here, aren't they? Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. As long as you don't see my underwear, it's yeah, no, fine. No, 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 she's good. She's <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no! Are you apologizing? <laughs> <laughs> you don't June popcorn bucket. I don't understand. Yeah, you're supposed to put your hand in there and eat the popcorn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't think they had an intern that had a, you know, how different um, mindset. Interest, how sensual. Thank well, the shoes. I know. Oh my God. I know. Oh, you, can, you know, you can try them later. <laughs> and the intellect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> how are you, Rebecca? I'm really well. Happy now. <laughs> this is good. Good. So, um... We're going to work on things. You say you have to ride a sandworm to earn your spot. Wow, so. look at that. That's what happened back in the days with MGM, but thankfully we moved on. I I love her. Anyways, like, comment, subscribe, support the channel through Patreon, Kofi, Cash App, or Venmo. Watch and share my videos on the Gaza Holocaust that YouTube is depressing. Don't forget to be a stranger. No gods, no masters. All cops are bastards. Wear a goddamn mask and free Palestine. I'll see y'all next time.